Welcome to today's webinar, everyone. To get us started, I'm going to hand it over to our CEO, J.B. Holston. Thanks very much, Jenna. Welcome, everybody. My name is J.B. Holston. I'm the CEO of the Greater Washington Partnership. And uh, as you can see in the logo behind me, we've done this specifically for Halloween week. Uh, actually not, but it's great to have everyone here in the second of our series on the American Rescue Plan. Uh, as all of you know, there's a tremendous incremental opportunity for the region from some of the federal programs that have been put in place and will be put in place, of which the American Rescue Plan is a critical one. So we're delighted to have this convening of experts around how secondary and post-secondary institutions uh, can and should take advantage of uh, the American Rescue Plan. Uh, quick couple of points of introduction then we'll uh, get the program started. The partnership, for those of you that don't know, is a 501c3. We're a not-for-profit that was formed about four years ago and has the backing of about 40 of the region's largest uh, employers uh, across all sectors. Um, we're unique in that we have a focus uh, on a multi-jurisdictional basis for the region, and we define the region as uh, Baltimore to Richmond. So our work encompasses Maryland, Virginia, and the district uh, as well. Uh, the collective interest of these group of large employers is in ensuring that this region uh, is the most inclusive growth region in the country. Uh, we've had McKinsey do work that shows that if in fact we can close the equity gap and provide the right kind of opportunity for all. Uh, we can grow the region's GDP by about uh, 50 billion uh, a year, but as importantly become the best pay place uh, for talent, both talent that uh, grows up here and talent that wants to come here. Uh, so we are laser focused on that objective. Uh, and as part of that, we've been delighted to bring educators and uh, employers together to focus hard on what we collectively can do uh, to make sure we're ahead of a change. Uh, I think that's more critical now than ever. Uh, all of you who are in the education business, I think would argue that uh, this is a time of more transformative change uh, for that sector than has ever been the case uh, before. And therefore it's a moment of great uh, opportunity. Um, we've got a variety of initiatives that relate to that. One of which uh, many of you are associated with the Capital CoLab, um, which uh, has focused on a couple of programmatic areas. One one is digital skills and talent. Uh, we uh, are delighted at all of the educational institutions that have signed on to that uh, initiative. Uh, and another around uh, Talent Ready, which is uh, focused on K through 12 across the region. And as it says, making sure that that talent is ready for the jobs uh, for tomorrow. So that's a little bit about us. Um, we, uh, uh, our overarching aim, as I mentioned, is to make sure that the region uh, wins uh, by every measure. Uh, and in order, one of the measures will be that we get more than our fair share of uh, the funding available through programs like the American Rescue Plan. And in order to ensure that that's the case. Um, we are delighted to have this webinar series and today have a series of experts who understand really well um, how we can all collectively and individually take advantage of uh, the plan in particular and set ourselves up for success um, as federal funding in particular increases in support of all of our collective uh, objectives. So that's what we're up to today. Um, I wanted to thank all of our panelists, all the folks you're going to hear from. They're terrific. Uh, and now let me introduce uh, Robert Owens, who is uh, our curator de chef, uh, our curator in chief uh, for this activity and has been uh, helping us, uh, of course, with Talent Ready and with our, our workforce efforts uh, now for an extended period. Over to you, Robert. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, JB. I really appreciate that. I want to welcome everybody to the second part of our American Rescue Plan webinar series. Now, this again is hosted by the Greater Washington Partnership Capital Collab. As JB said, I'm Robert Owens, the Director for Workforce Initiatives at the Capital Collab. And today we will discuss how American Rescue Plan funds, ARPA funds, will affect K-12 schools, colleges, and universities. Today, we are joined by experts who are going to provide innovative approaches and perspectives for educational institutions in their jurisdictions. Now, we have provided QR codes throughout the presentation that will lead to additional resources that we mentioned during this session. Now, to access those resources, you simply will point your cell phone's camera to the QR code, and the link should appear at the top of your phone screen. Now, also, there will be opportunity for you to ask questions, so please feel free to drop some questions in the Q&A chat box that we have uh, at the bottom of the screen. So to kick us off, I would like to introduce Dr. Vicki Maple. She's the Senior Director of Thomas P. Miller and Associates. Dr. Maple will walk us through the American Rescue Plan Blueprint. 
She is a national senior director at TPMA. Her expertise lies in the process of discovering and implementing effective innovative solutions for specific business and industry challenges, while also building ecosystems where educational institutions are centric to the model. Vicky fulfilled her term as the National Commissioner for Economic Development and Workforce Solutions with the American Association of Community Colleges and served for seven years as a Vice President at the Community and Technical College in Central Ohio. Prepared at the doctoral level with her dissertation research centered on the role of two-year institutions in bridging the workforce gaps for the engineering technology sector, Victor also completed Harvard Graduate School's Institute for Management and Leadership. So with that, I'd like to toss it over to Dr. Vicki Maple. Dr. Maple, take it away. Thank you, Robert. And I already feel so connected to, to so many of you in these colliding worlds of higher education administration and workforce development, economic development, as I did come to TPMA, as Robert mentioned, after having served as vice president for economic development and workforce solutions at a community college in central Ohio. And in that role, plus in my current role, and much like each of you, you know, we are really finding ourselves at that intersection of workforce solutions, of economic resiliency, of, of community development, and of educational strategies, research, and evaluation. And here at TPMA, we've actually found ourselves over the past year and a half or so um, just really absolutely entrenched in, in programs and partnerships across the country navigating the, the influx of, of federal funding and, of course, centering on recovery and resiliency uh, solutions. So in an attempt to, to best support our clients, our partners, we created a briefing or, or a summary, a, a snapshot piece of the American Rescue Plan Act. And uh, if I could have the next slide, please, what we're going to do is, um, you know, we're, I'm hoping number one, that, that many of you have, have likely perused it already. And then hopefully you're, you've been able to use that as a helpful resource as it was designed to provide an overview to illuminate examples of, of uses of funds, to present timelines, to review reporting requirements, to uh, provide those links to those additional resources we need, and then really to present a snapshot of high level information. Now, I should note our final documentation was based on the federal interim uh, final ruling from May 17th, which is still the, the, the most current ruling, but we are told it's not yet the final. But today I'm going to cover some of the highlights from our guide, including again, the, a, a quick overview of the funding, a few exemplars of uses of funds, as well as considerations for ecosystems involving both educators and workforce boards. Next slide, please. So again, you know, we've all heard of the American Rescue Plan. We, we know that there's $350 billion available for, for state, for local, for territorial, and for uh, tribal governments. And the key funding objectives are prioritized as supporting the, the COVID response efforts, replacing lost public uh, sector revenue, supporting economic stabilization, and then, of course, addressing public health and economic challenges, as you see there. Uh, the next slide, please. So we here at TPMA, we have spent a great deal of time with institutions of higher education, with workforce boards, with economic development practitioners, and with community leaders, reviewing all of these special earmarks, allocations that uh, ha have been included, including, I should say, over 195 billion dollars for states in the District of Columbia alone, over $65 billion for counties, nearly $46 billion for metropolitan cities, and then plus that $40 billion through HERF and through and, and, and the $36 billion allocated to public and private nonprofit uh, institutions to remain available through September 30th of, of 2023. And so as you know, institutions can use those remaining funds to replace lost revenue uh, for reimbursements for, for emergency expenses. And again, this is after 50% of the allocations have been expended uh, specifically for emergency uh, uh, financial aid grants for, for our students. So on this slide that you're looking at right now, I included those five areas of focus for your review because 
these are the projects that are receiving priority in, uh, attention right now at the federal level. And there could likely be opportunities for you as educators uh, to partner with regional or state authorities to be part of a grander project uh, and quite frankly, part of the, a solution strategy. So first, you know, public health response, consider opportunities for PPE acquisition, for uh, vaccine education, for training public health and safety personnel and first responders. With respect to the public sector revenue loss, I'm gonna ask you to put on your, your government services meets economic development hats here for a moment and think of the lost public sector revenue caused by the pandemic and solutions to then strengthen support for vital job retention and public services. Also the third point there, water service broadband uh, infrastructure. Uh, uh, you know, not glamorous, but certainly necessary in meeting critical needs of the public and, and certainly of think about your virtual and online learners. For premium pay for essential workers, federal funding is available for those, um, those, those low to moderate income workers who perform essential work who are likely your students. Maybe even students who have stopped out because of their work in healthcare at grocery stores in food service, in education and, and, and child care, in public transit. And then that fifth point there, certainly relevant to our, our conversation is the priority for addressing negative impacts. So if I could have the next slide, please. This includes everything from providing assistance to, to unemployed workers, the food and housing insecure, rehiring staff and job training provisions, small business support, technical assistance, uh, the most greatly impacted industries, tourism, travel, hospitality, and of course, certainly addressing disparities, providing equity-focused resources and support services to those underserved populations, while also creating alliances with partner organizations to increase access to these necessary services. Next slide, please. And so we're going to button up um, uh, my portion, at least, of this conversation with some considerations, some recommendations, some immediate action steps that you can take back to your institution or back to your organization. So first, it's critical that you follow the funding, the application timelines, the evaluation and reporting uh, requirements. Please, please, please just know these, lock them in, make sure that, that they're, they're, they're concrete. Second, as part of the discovery uh, phase, explore those uh, local processes and procedures. For example, how is your state or region or, or your community served leveraging the funding? How is the funding flowing? What is the process for applying? Uh, what's the process for requesting or even accessing these funds? And keep in mind that processes are varying across the country. You know, some states, are funding state level initiatives while others are prioritizing local areas or projects specific to a region. So reach out to your workforce agency leaders as well as chief or local officials who are serving on your workforce boards and also connect to your colleagues here in education and higher education in economic development. You know, the Economic Development Association, the EDA, has, has, has opportunities such as the Build Back Better um, Regional Challenge and the Good Jobs Challenge, as well as others. The Department of Education has additional funding streams, which we're going to hit up on here uh, momentarily. The USDA is issuing housing and mental health and human and social services allocations. The key here is to leveraging those relationships and to not going at this alone or, or, or in a vacuum. And then finally, timing is of essence. You know, we need to work expediently, but with intention. And the funds, if you note uh, or recall, are to be obligated by December 31st of 2024, but then expended by December 31st of 2026. And I know that we've all become so accustomed to restrictive funding and nearly impossible deadlines, but we do have a bit more flexibility here with ARPA. So think about what you've wanted to do, but haven't had the funding or flexibility to complete yet. Do you have a strategic plan? How can you use these, these resources to address some of your, your priorities? 
and really think long term. Uh, think bigger impact. Think future needs. And by all means, be willing to explore uh, new, new possibilities. Now, as I take a breath here for just a second, I wanted to just mention that also hot off the press uh, here at TPMA, we created a top 10 list. And, and well, first of all, who doesn't love a top 10 list, right? But it's a top 10 list for education to leverage our funding. And I will make this available to Robert to circulate if anyone's interested. I can also post it in the chat. But like I said, it's fresh off the press. So the top 10 ways to leverage ARP funding for educators, here's what we came up with. Number 10, remediation. Directly addressing learning loss, those remediation needs potentially caused by remote classes during school closures. You know, ARP uh, funding requires at least 20% of funds to address pandemic-related learning loss. So let's take advantage of that. Number nine, collaboration with workforce ecosystems. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, and the plan appropriates $2 billion through the Department of Labor for ecosystem building. So let's, let's hone in on that. Number eight, sustainability versus uh, uh, scalability versus sustainability projects. In this, we need to account for environmental impact and also effective long lasting programming. Number seven, professional development. It's self-explanatory. Number six is student safety. So follow those CDC guidelines, consider possible um, uses such as PPE in, in campus health centers or effective, effective campus lighting for the safety of your students. Also number five, broadband and, and, and uh, cybersecurity. Number four, staffing and faculty or, or staff training as well as payroll support, totally acceptable here. Number three, student advising. Also emphasizing, of course, strategies for low-income families, first-gen college students, and of course, addressing the application process, those financial hurdles, um, college choices, that can all be wrapped into this. Number two is career pathways meets competency-based education meets prior learning assessment processes. So expand your portfolio of, of career pathways, of work-based learning experiences, and, and explore those opportunities for partnering with labor unions and community colleges. And then number one, again, infrastructure, be it transportation, water sewer, or actual education infrastructure, helping those, those lower income districts who lack the infrastructure to teach remotely, an important and viable and one of the most critical places to, to place our efforts. With that, of course, I just simply want to uh, wish you the best. Certainly my colleagues and I here at TPMA, we would be honored to chat with you further about next steps, about opportunities for building out your plans, strategies for leveraging and maximizing these funds. And I look forward to the rest of the conversation uh, with all of you today. Thank you so much, Dr. Maple. And as she said, we are going to post uh, the information of those resources in the link. So feel free to uh, go to the link to uh, get that information, as well as we'll be far more information after this webinar. So now that Dr. Maple has given us the foundation of the blueprint and how education institutions can use our funds uh, at the state and local level, we'll now hear from Matt Gangdo, uh, President and CEO of Educational Strategy Group. Matt founded ESG in 2012 to support state, national organizations and foundations committed to dramatically improving the capacity and performance of the US educational system. He brings over 20 years of experience leading policy development, advocacy and implementation work in both K-12 and higher education. Matt, can you provide us a national perspective on how secondary and post-secondary institutions are utilizing these funds? Sure, thanks so much, Robert. And JB and others for having me today. Um, great to be here with you all. Um, ESG, just a quick, quick overview. We're, as, as you just heard, we're a strategic consulting firm that works across the country to try to build better pathways from education into careers and, and, and the workforce. Um, and can't think of a greater moment to take advantage of this opportunity, as JB uh, uh, said earlier. We're proud to be a partner with um, GWP um, Talent Ready Initiative that J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation has generously funded for the, the D.C. region, um, and it's making a real difference for uh, young people and adults alike. Um, so this is historic. I just want to underscore 
uh, so it doesn't get, you don't get lose it in the details what Vicki was saying. The size of the investment in the American Rescue Plan and the broader stimulus dollars that were uh, put forward before that is, is unprecedented in our nation's history. It's the largest investment ever from the federal government into at least focusing on the education system and education to workforce pipeline. Um, the last time there was an investment this, you know, even close to this was during the Great Recession, 2009, with a, a similar stimulus package. I was lucky enough to be serving as a senior advisor in the U.S. Department of Education under uh, Secretary Arne Duncan at the time and had firsthand experience on how you can uh, strategically leverage uh, a large amount of resources to try to, uh, as Vicki said, not just do the short-term recovery work, but the long-term innovation work that we, we know is so important, uh, not only to this region, but to other regions around the country. Um, but I'll just say it right at the beginning, I think it is not a foregone conclusion that um, education institutions are gonna have the bandwidth uh, or the leadership commitment or ability to drive long-term innovation with these dollars. So I think that's gonna be the real test for this region and, and other regions is will, you know, will institutions be able to step up, build those partnerships Think of the long term, not just the short term, with this historic amount of money. So the reality is, everybody knows there was a serious economic up, upheaval. So a lot of people are struggling uh, in the capital region and beyond. Um, but also, a high school diploma is long, no longer enough. So if you think of the investments that we're, we're getting the opportunity to make in in K twelve, our strong view is um, the end game can't be graduating high school successfully. It needs to be continuing to and through post secondary. The vast majority of the jobs, certainly in the capital region and around the country, require a credential beyond the high school diploma. Um, sadly, um, a lot of students dropped out of the high school to college pipeline during COVID, um, particularly low income and minority students. So we've got a gap to close there and ground to make up there. Not all credentials are created equal, so it's not any higher ed credential. It's really understanding how the labor market has shifted and what programs you stand up and scale for students, both traditional age and adult learners, to make sure they have a credential that opens doors to jobs in the economy today and not yesterday. We also see um, the need for adult upskilling and reskilling and a great opportunity with these resources to bring out of work adults back and uh, reskill and upskill. So I'm gonna hit all those themes um, right now. What you see on the screen is just drilling down a little more deeply on what K-12 and higher ed have access to in this, uh, in this new pot of money on the American Rescue Plan. As I said, it's a substantial amount of money. Let's keep your eyes on the left here that the vast majority of the money goes directly to local school districts. Uh, the states have more limited control than in uh, previous rounds of, of, um, of federal resources. And um, a certain portion of it needs to go to address learning loss, as was heard. But honestly, there's a significant amount of flexibility for how those dollars can be spent, much more so than in, um, in previous years with federal investments of this type. On the higher ed side, nearly 40 billion, as you heard, 50% of that needs to go directly to student aid. But there's a lot of interesting flexibility around how, the, how those dollars can be used. And 50% goes to institutional strategies uh, to support institutional recovery and hopefully innovation. If you go to the next slide. At ESG, we've spent a lot of time looking around the country and trying to help work with leaders to um, understand what, the, what some of the most strategic investments that could be made are. And we've put a framework together, you can see here on the screen, that focuses on three areas that are both gap closing and innovation inspiring. Uh, the first is increasing enrollment in post-secondary education. Um, higher ed has taken a big hit. Enrollment has dropped nearly 5% overall and much more steep declines for community colleges during COVID. That's having a financial, um, uh, that has financial repercussions, excuse me, for institutions and obviously for the, for the students themselves, they're uh, losing out on the opportunity to um, get that education. So that's one lens. A second is completion. We've seen um, greater numbers of students uh, drop out or stop out who start higher education. In fact, the rates declined 2% year over year when COVID hit and we're fearful they'll continue to go, uh, the rates will go down and that's not a good thing for students who need those credentials to succeed. And then third and really importantly, compete. So how can the investments be made so that the pathways, the credentials, the programs are leading 
both young people and adults to viable opportunities in today's economy. And as JB said earlier, as a region, how do we make sure that we're paying attention to where we want to be um, and the economic opportunity and economic mobility we want to create and investing these funds in ways that are more likely to do that. So we've looked around the country, as I said, I'm going to give you a quick snapshot and some examples that we've seen, but if you go to the next slide, but you'll also see here a way to look more deeply. Um, Invest Forward is a campaign we launched to identify um, shovel-ready investment strategies that we've seen around the country for using these dollars, both in K-12 and higher education. If you go to the Invest Forward website, I think uh, we might drop that into the chat. You can drill down and look at examples from around the country how the dollars are being spent in innovative ways. I'll give you a quick snapshot using those three lenses of enroll, complete, compete right now. So if we go to the next slide, thank you. Enroll, so here's a few examples of some really ambitious investments to increase enrollment at a time where it's desperately needed. Texas, uh, actually in 2020, um, launched the Texas Summer Bridge Program using both their own money and federal stimulus funds. They targeted the class of 2020 students who hadn't yet met college ready benchmarks in high school. The program offered guidance and counseling support, scholarships, performance incentives for teachers and advisors to get their students into this program. 40 university partners, 300 school districts, 20,000 students participated. It was pretty massive. Most importantly, the result was an uptick in completion rates first year for those students when they entered college of 20%. So it made a huge difference and they've continued it ever since. Indiana saw what Texas did. They took their IRP money and invested it in a summer bridge program this past summer with similar intent focused on students that were at risk of either not showing up for college in the fall who enrolled or might not be successful when they got there. Um, they saw a big uptick in success rates this fall from that investment this summer. And then we have other local examples like Compton College and others that are using this in more strategic ways at the local level to bridge the gap. You go to the next slide. Uh, in terms of completion, we've seen a lot of interesting investments in advising and uh, year-round coursework. So Eastern Carolina University is an example of an institution that um, saw that students were dropping out or stopping out by not continuing their education through the summer. So they made free course offerings available to students on accelerated timelines to accelerate time to degree over the summer using these dollars and provide tuition grants and targeted those at at-risk students. In Connecticut, they made a, a huge investment in hiring advisors, something Vicki mentioned er, earlier, uh, and case managers to focus on students who were at risk of stopping out. And that looks like it's making a big difference. And then there's a college example, Amarillo College, that's done the same thing with these dollars hired significant number of case managers and social workers to try to address basic needs and really double down on advising to try to make sure young people stay in and don't stop out. You go to the next slide. Now, most importantly, compete. So how are, um, how are we seeing higher ed and K-12 institutions and systems um, really aim their resources to ensure there's a continuum through the credential attainment into, into employment? Chicago Public Schools launched an entirely new work-based work learning center with these dollars uh, that's going to stand up and scale much more significant opportunities around apprenticeships and internships for their students working with employers in the region to make sure that there are well-paying jobs. So that's, a, that's something to keep your eyes on. New York City has done something similar, um, significantly scaled up what they call their learning work initiative, which is also paid internships and apprenticeships for students in the K-12 system working closely with the employer community in New York City. Uh, and then we have some other examples around the country of pathways expansion for uh, programs that are leading to credentials that open the door to well-paying jobs. And these dollars are going toward that in the K-12 sector as well. If you go to the next slide, and the last examples I have is on the college side. I mentioned earlier, great opportunity to use these funds to um, support adult learners or adults who have either not completed a credential and um, left and went into the workforce or now need to come back to upskill and reskill. Um, the federal financial aid dollars that are in the American Rescue Plan are allowed to be used for short-term credentials in a way that currently the Pell Grants are not. 
So that's something really important to keep in mind. So you have more flexibility for using ARP dollars for financial aid to support adults who might want to come back for a short-term credential that could be stackable and work toward a degree in ways you don't with Pell dollars. So I just want to make sure that's really clear. So what we're seeing in these examples you see on the screen is institutions that have taken advantage of that to target adult learners who stopped out. Um, cities, colleges in Chicago have done that and they offer free programs at no cost to the students in fields that are high growth fields um, in the city of Chicago and the Chicago region. That's something to keep in mind for the DC region. California just made a, a, a massive investment, I think of nearly $500 million um, in, um, in uh, the same kind of idea, grants for uh, adults coming back who can upskill and credential in high growth areas around the state. And then Ivy Tech Community College is a great example of a community college system that has made investment and in, uh, sort of free opportunities to earn a credential in a high demand field, accessible during COVID um, and really done a good job outreaching to those adults to get them to come back and take advantage of those programs. And the numbers there are very, very impressive. So that's a snapshot. Uh, if you go to the next slide where I'll wrap up, that's a snapshot of what we feel are really innovative approaches to using these dollars, not just to recover, but to innovate and try to look long-term at what can be scaled to ensure the success of um, cities and regions using these funds. Again, increase enrollment because post-secondary uh, matters more than ever. Uh, completion is important, just entering the institution isn't enough. And most importantly, what pathways and programs and credentials are young people and adults having access to that open the doors to economic opportunity? Great chance with these resources to do things that you couldn't do before. And we're really hopeful that leaders will uh, take some bold steps um, while they're plugging the holes um, so that we can really uh, advance the cause uh, significantly with, with this kind of once in a generation uh, investment the federal government is making. Thanks. Thank you so much, Matt. And we have dropped the link in the uh, chat for you to be able to go to these resources. I also want to point out, if you could also drop your affiliations in the chat, we would like to know who's participating, who's part of this uh, particular webinar. So again, thank you so much, Matt. Now we're going to narrow the scope down to the capital region to focus on a specific on specific initiatives and programs occurring within the greater capital region. So we have an expert or roundtable panelists. Today we have uh, Ellen Earps, Vice Chancellor of Admin and Finance in the University of Systems in Maryland. We have Dr. Charlene Dukes, Energy Room President at Montgomery College, and Dr. Dallas Dance, President of the D Dance Group. So I would like to start with Ellen with you first. Ellen, can you give us some examples of how the University System of Maryland are using these ARP funds? Great. <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Robert. And hello, everyone. Uh, the University System of Maryland, which is 12 universities and three regional centers, um, about 165,000 students enrolled. That was about 170,000, Matt. So uh, your uh, comment about enrollment not quite being back to where it was pre-pandemic, we certainly have seen. If you add all of the monies from the three um, COVID-related bills, as well as those that were directed to minority-serving institutions, and HBCUs, of which we have three in the system, we received a total of about $656 million. Uh, of that, if you remember, the first bill had um, monies that were specifically designed to flow through universities to students directly for their financial needs. That was about $208 million of that for us. So we're working with about $447 million. I'm gratified to hear um, that our use of federal funds is in line with those at least recovery activities that I heard Dr. Maple and Mr. Gandell talk about. First and foremost, additional financial aid to get students back who were suffering financial difficulties. We also um, had a loan forgiveness programs at several of our schools for near completers. So starting with seniors in good academic standing who had outstanding balances that were preventing them from coming back and finishing their degrees and working our way through that. We spent a good deal of funds for tech for students, staff, and faculty, both hardware, laptops, and so forth, but as well broadband. Um, 
as, as we all know, uh, in this area, we're not quite where we need to be in broadband across the entire state of Maryland, at least. We're looking forward to the broadband funds coming in the infrastructure bill. So we actually had to um, set up additional broadband opportunities for students. We also did quite a bit of faculty development. After the March 2020, that, after that spring semester completed, we spent the summer um, training faculty in great depth um, and also working with other educational institutions across the state to provide training so that our faculty was better able to teach online. Um, and then finally, all the COVID related uh, safety expenses, including testing, social distancing, masking, and our medical school at UMB, University of Maryland, Baltimore, was actually instrumental in testing around the state. Um, unfortunately, Matt, um, we haven't yet spent a lot of money on those forward strategic investments. Frankly, the lost revenue, which we also covered some of, the lost revenue and increased costs were significant enough that um, we still have um, gaps in our financial um, outcomes, even with the federal funds. But I really appreciate those forward-looking ideas and I'm gonna take them back to the team. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Erps. Um, I'd like to bring in Dr. Dukes uh, to understand what are the similarities that you are noticing uh, at Montgomery College. Dr. Dukes. Uh, thank you so much. And it's a delight to be here with all of my colleagues and to listen to the work that you're doing, uh, not only nationally, but across the region. So here at Montgomery College, uh, we serve about 52,000 students at three campuses and two centers. And as a result of the pandemic, we also partnered with the uh, Hope Center out of Temple University. And what they were able to share with us is that actually a large percent of our students were impacted by the pandemic. About 41% had um, lost their jobs over that time. And another 33% were still struggling, trying to make ends meet and looking not only for the current uh, employment that they had, but trying to see where additional part-time employment could be available. And I think that what you'll hear relative to Montgomery College is certainly what was shared to us by our colleague uh, from the University System of Maryland, uh, that we received about $75 million in, in total funds. And we've expended uh, so far about $20 million to students through a combination of uh, paying off uh, loan forgiveness uh, to uh, supporting uh, uh, tuition and fees, and then also looking at ways that we can support them in terms of food insecurity and housing insecurity. Uh, because you know, for many of uh, many community colleges across the nation that uh, we're not residentially based and our students are living in the communities that we serve. So those are things, professional development for faculty. I think that on March 14th or so, when we all uh, closed down uh, really suddenly, we knew that we had to do some things to ensure that faculty had all of the technology and all of the training possible to be able to move into that uh, uh, hybrid, in some cases, environment, and in other cases, uh, fully virtual environments. And then doing the same thing for our students. We too have uh, expended resources on technology, on uh, hotspots, brand, broadband access. And then I think the last thing that I would say is that uh, in terms of all of the safety measures that we are um, taking at our institutions, including things like um, uh, HVAC and air filters, all of those things we want to do to ensure that as we reopen and, and, and learn uh, from the lessons that we've been taught over the course of this past year, that higher education may not be delivered entirely the same way that it has in the past. And innovatively, we've got to, we've got to see the crisis also as an opportunity relative to the education we provide and the service that we do in the communities in which the college resides. So I'll stop there as well. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Dukes. I'm going to shift gears now to Dr. Dallas Dance with the D Dance Group. Dr. Dance, can you tell me what trends you are seeing in the use of funds as it relates to the K-12 space? 
Sure. Thank you, Robert, for the opportunity to be here, for you and the partnership. I really do appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to echo some of the sentiments that my, my colleague Matt and, and Vicky spoke about that, you know, one of the things that I think K-12 is really trying to figure out now is where do they fit in into the space that we find ourselves? We, you know, there's a lot of money, as Matt said, a record investment. But at the same time, though, we know that as people talk about this new normal, that that's not the way we need to look at this. Uh, a lot of people are trying to go back and say, OK, now we have our kids in school, we have our faculty back. Let's pick up to where we left off. And that's that's just not what we can do. Um, I think that if, we, if we're smart, we'll use this, this investment as an opportunity to sort of reimagine what we want learning to be from a K-20 approach, or I should say a pre-K-20 approach. Um, and so here at the D-Dance Group, we work with about 80 to 85 school systems across the country. We really focus on those districts and those schools that want to be innovative, that really want to sort of move the needle for all of their students, not just you know, some of their students. And so I think the biggest thing that we're seeing that, that people really are focusing on is the well-being of their students and their teachers and their staff. Um, I think that's most important right now as you know, we get back into it and we know we're going to pick up, we know we're going to go slow to go fast on several things, but we have to take care of our people too. And I think one of the biggest things that folks are doing is really focusing on mental health, uh, not ne necessarily just again for teachers and staff, but really for our students. And so some of the most innovative approaches we've seen is some individuals who've partnered with, with whether it's private companies or, or nonprofits in their community to say, how do we make sure that there's universal access to our mental health providers across the country? And so as we've had to pivot to telehealth and, and more things virtual anyway, we want to make sure that we're using those people on the ground as more so our tier two, tier three resources for our students, but every single individual needs to have universal access. And it's not, again, just for students, but it's also for teachers. As Vicky talked about and Matt talked about, the learning loss is extremely huge. But what, what we found, though, is that across the country with our partner districts is that folks are not assuming that there is as much learning loss as, we, as we're thinking. Um, if, you, if you look at uh, some of the most recent research and studies that we've seen from the voices of students, students are, they're not in the best place, but in terms of learning loss, they're not as far behind as we automatically think they are. Their well-being is important, but they also want to look at what's the next stage of learning look like for them. And so I think, again, some of the most innovative districts are really thinking about how do we redesign middle school? How do we redesign high school? But we redesign high school with a focus on post-secondary success. And so I know when I was a superintendent, we used to focus a lot of time on building those partnerships with the community college to say, how do we bring those programs to our high school students? So, you know, I know they're debating right now whether we're gonna you know, move to free community college and there are reports that might not be in it, but there's money in K-12 right now to where we can bring community college to our students. We can also bring community college to our parents. And one of the last things I'll mention that is in terms of innovation, a lot of districts right now are saying, what does the relationship with our families and our communities look like? And so as we're expanding our parent university programs, our parent outreach initiatives, we want to do this with, with, with the idea of learning in mind for our students and families. And so we want to make sure that, again, as much as we can bring parents to our buildings or to an educational setting, we want to make sure that we're providing those, those, uh, them those opportunities. And so, again, I think there's this balance that, you know, as, 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 as President Dukes talked about, making sure that our buildings are safe, making sure that we keep our students in school with, with tests to, to, to stay in those types of methods. But at the end of the day, though, we also want to not look back five years from now and realize that we've squandered the opportunity to look at this record investment in, in, in pre-K-20. Uh, so I'm excited to be here again. Thank you, Robert. Thank you to, to the partnership for the opportunity. And I'm looking forward uh, to the discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Dance, and to all of you for that top level summary on what you all are doing or have seen. So I want to shift to a roundtable style Q&A where I could get your perspective on specific topics. Now, I know we talked on time, so I may be able to ask like maybe one or two questions. Uh, but I want to start, of course, with you, Dr. Deuce. And I then want to, you know, each of you to chime in. You know, what factors have you taken into account to ensure equity and how these funds are being used? In other words, how would the programs funded by ARP benefit those who have the most to gain from this additional stimulus dollars? Well, I, I think that uh, there are a couple of things that we've been able to do. One is that Montgomery College is a, is a minority serving institution across um, a number of the factors that help to define that. We actually just received a notification that we are now an Hispanic serving institution. Uh, we're an Asian American Pacific Islander and also predominantly a black institution in terms of the PBI definition. So that um, quite frankly, equity for us is based not just on race, it's based on income, socioeconomic status. And then working with our financial aid office, we were able to put uh, together an algorithm 
that allowed us to look at students and their need across a variety of factors and ensure that the dollars that we had were going to the students most in need. We pride ourselves on being, as, as the uh, immediate past president termed the phrase, radically inclusive. So we're making sure that um, we are not doing things that have been sort of status quo in, in our work and certainly not in our ability to fund and support our students. Thank you so much, Dr. Dews. I'd like to pose the same question to you, Ella Herbs. Thank you. Um, so with 12 universities and three regional centers and then a system office, you know, what we've done at the system, but all of the presidents and executive directors have done is meet regularly throughout the pandemic. At one point we were meeting three times a week with the presidents twice a week with the student affairs and, and provost twice a week with the VPs of admin and finance for the last 19 months. And what that has done is enabled us to share across the best ideas and promulgate those best ideas. And, and so it is with making sure that we're using the money wisely and in an equitable way. The system, and, and folks may not be aware of this, is minority ma majority already uh, in terms of student population. And certainly once we made sure that everybody had the funds um, from the federal government that was allocated to them, we actually, and this was allowed um, in the language of the programs, we had a university who said, you know, we're not going to be able to use all of our institutional funds. Who needs it? Which I don't think we'd ever seen in the system. It was an amazing moment of collaboration. So um, I think when we looked at the financial aid, we certainly, as Dr. Dukes mentioned, looked at those most in need, those who um, not only had need around tuition and fees and so forth, but who uh, we had a number of students stay on campuses throughout this who simply didn't have a home to go to or had a place where which was not conducive to living during a pandemic. And we certainly were looking at those students as well in terms of what they needed. But I think the collaboration amongst the leadership at the system was instrumental in making sure we were sharing the best ideas across all the universities. Dr. Dentz? Robert, I'm seeing sort of three things that districts are doing. One is this whole redesign of special education uh, right now. We know right now that many of our IEPs are out, out of compliance, that many of our supports that we provide to our students are just not there. And so the redesign of that to make sure that those collaborative teaching environments are, are there, that the planning time is there for both teachers to do that work. We also are looking at individual uh, districts who are really thinking about how might they look at finding their students. So we know right now some districts are reporting as much as 10% of their students who they've not been able to locate, whether they are students who might have been impacted by the pandemic and the mckinney Ventil Act has to sort of come into play, or students that, as Matt talked about, who dropped out. Um, and then the last thing they're recognizing is that as they look forward, they're going to have a teacher shortage soon. And how do they partner with those agencies in higher education right now to make sure that students who are currently in their buildings right now, if they can get them hooked into the teaching profession, be able to have them matriculate through, through college, whether it's in a community college and then go on to a four year institution, which is cheaper um, in many states, particularly in the state of Maryland, uh, that they, if they do that, then they can come back and actually be able to, to, to provide that type of service and support to future generations. Those are the three things that, that we're seeing. And Dr. Dennis, if I can stay with you, uh, can you tell us you know, how you feel institutions can measure the effectiveness of offer funded programs? And in other words, in your view, what do successful programs look like? Absolutely, and that's a loaded question. So I'll, I'll try to take that in about, about one minute or less. Um, I think the biggest thing is to have a strategy. Um, a lot of, and this is what's worrying me a little bit with K-12 right now, a lot of times K-12, especially with the political pressure that in many cases they're under, they're not thinking through the strategy of how they wanna use those funds. They're sort of just giving them out or they're holding off because they're a little bit worried about how to do it. I think a strategy up front where you think about what are you trying to do? How might you go about doing it? And then how will you know you've done it well? And I know that K-12 uh, systems are doing it really well. They're partnering with higher ed to say, how do we add a research-based component to what it is that we're doing? Whether it is providing homegrown teacher uh, you know, development programs, there is a, a, a research component tied to that. But also if we're providing professional development to our teachers, there's a research component tied to that because we got to get the voices of those individuals to see how they feel after that professional development. And then how is that translating to student outcomes in the classroom? Um, but I also think that the districts who are doing this well are those who are focusing on fewer things, not more things. Um, and how do we actually go back to basics, focus on quality and not quantity? 
Thank you, Dr. Dance. I want to ask you, Matt, if you could chime in too, you know, having that national perspective, you know, again, can you talk about the effectiveness of these ARP fund programs and, you know, in your viewpoint, you know, what do successful programs look like? Great question. And by the way, there are a lot of people on Capitol Hill are going to be asking that same question, given the, the historic size of this investment. So I think it's incumbent upon all of us in the education community to try to, you know, point to results as much as possible and be, and be planning for results. When those questions come back, we want to be able to say, here's the impact the resources had. And um, it's why we should continue to invest in our education system. Um, and that's not an insignificant challenge. So I'm glad you raised it. And on the equity issue, by the way, the populations that have been hit hardest by COVID are the populations that we're trying to address in, in our in agenda around equity, whether it's colleges or K-12 systems. So students of color and low-income students disproportionately dropping out of the college pipeline. Um, students of color and low-income students disproportionately stopping out of college. Uh, adults of color and low-income adults disproportionately out of work or needing to upskill and reskill. So the, the data sort of screaming in our face that these dollars need to, to go in that direction. I think that the opportunity um, is there. Uh, I'll, I'll agree with Dr. Dance, sort of focus on a small number of strategic priorities, try to advance them is, is easier than spreading the money around to everyone who asks for it, or you know, spread some of it around and then reserve a, a portion of it for the innovative forward thinking approaches also think about the types of investments. Obviously, eventually there could be a funding cliff if you just bring on more staff, um, you'd have to sustain them. So things that I've heard that are innovative that hit both these points, investing in data systems and the ability to um, sort of monitor the success of your programs and of the students when they leave you and go into the workforce. Here's a great opportunity to take some of these resources and make that investment. Um, in a one-time investment, as an example. Um, the last thing I'll say is for those who are kind of in the business community or the broader civic and political community, um, provide some cover and encourage the education leaders to step out a little bit and take some of these risks with these dollars because it's not the tendency uh, and the federal government tends not to be encouraging that, at least right now. So where is that encouragement gonna come from? Maybe it comes from the broader communities that these institutions are based in, where folks are encouraging some portion of these resources to be used for forward thinking, strategic moves that you don't often get the opportunity to make. It's lonely for a leader to try to move in that direction if they don't have the support of their broader community. And a lot of people in their institutions are asking for the funds to go to this, that, and the other, and it can get really challenging to reserve some funds for this kind of strategic priorities we've been hearing about. All right, thank you so much, Matt. I really appreciate it. I know we're up on time, so you know, wish we had more time to ask a lot more questions. But you know, hey, this is a great, great series. Uh, you know that we really like to continue to have. Um, again, thank you so much for Dr. Vicky Maple, Matt Gandel, Dr. Dallas Stans, Dr. Charlene Dukes, and Ellen Hurst for providing insight into the programs and strategies for secondary and post-secondary institutions. On that note, thank you so very much for coming to this roundtable. I would like to invite you to attend our next webinar which is a series of webinars called Diversity Matters, Creating Better Pipelines for Diverse Talent in a Capital Region. As a thought leader, convener, and catalyst in work-based learning, here at the CoLab, we have identified that employers across the Capital Region are trying to find innovative approaches, as mentioned today, to hire diverse talent in IT. So we want you to join us along with ICF in partnership to support with the Department of Labor for our webinar happening November 9th at 10.30 a.m. Now, this is a discussion on how businesses can attract, build, and strengthen their IT and cybersecurity workforce with formal training and work-based learning and programs. So we are excited for each of you to join us for our next webinar. With that, thank you so much to Destiny Mitchell, Ramar Sina, and the entire CoLab team for their work in putting today's webinar together. Be sure to check out us on our website at the greater washington partnership.com more exciting and engaging events are also feel free to email us at collab at greater washington partnership.com thank you so much all for joining us we look forward to seeing you at our next event take care